Welcome to Energy Unplugged, the go-to podcast on the global energy transition. My name is Thaddeus Kreisig, and I'm a project leader in Aurora's advisory team in Germany. I'm delighted to be joined today by Anna von Bremen, partner at Osborne Clark, Germany. Osborne Clark is an international law firm with offices around the globe, including Europe, the US, and Asia. At Osborne Clark, Germany, Anna is heading the Energy Innovation Department. Her clients include project developers, energy trading companies, and utilities. In particular, Anna is advising energy storage projects regarding regulatory hurdles like network connection and permitting procedures. Another focus of her advisory work is the marketing of battery storage systems. Anna, welcome to Energy Unplugged. Thanks, Ted. Happy to be here. Thank you. Anna, flexibility in the energy system will play a key role to facilitate the scale-up of renewable energy generation globally, but even more so in Germany, where the government builds heavily on renewables, right? In recent years, we have seen substantial movement in the storage sector, driven by large-scale battery storage systems and renewables in Germany. Throughout this episode, I'd like to investigate with you how storage systems and renewables can go together. Uh, let's start it off with a bit of background. What does the current regulatory environment for renewables look like? How can they earn back the investment costs? Sure, let's start with the basics. So, so currently we still have like a quite heavily subsidized market for renewables in Germany. That probably makes sense to differentiate between four revenue streams. So about, let's say, 20% of all renewable power fed into the grid is still subsidized by the classical feed-in tariff. Larger plants and probably about... 70 to 80 percent of renewable production receives state funding under the so-called market premium model. Market premium mm -hmm. that is probably known to most listeners means that the installation participates in a tendering procedure conducted by the federal network agency and in case average spot market prices fall below the value of the award um, the operator is compensated for the difference by the network operator. Finally, up to about 10% of renewable reg um, generation does not receive any, any subsidy, any state funding. Part of these plants market their generation through PPAs. Others are fully mm -hmm. merchant, meaning that they merely rely on spot market prices. Cool. Very interesting. Thank you uh, for the summary. I mean, we, we saw already that, that a lot of these renewables are still backed by, by government spending or government securities, at least. How does it look like for batteries? How can they earn back their investment costs uh, in the German power market? So talking about funding for batteries probably makes sense to take a step back and to look at the different use cases for batteries we're talking about. So mm -hmm. the storages that are actually most prominent in public perception and actually also form the largest part of our advisory work are the so-called standalone battery energy storage systems, also called BES. Those are utility scale storages of a size of 10 megawatt up to several hundred megawatts that are usually erected in the outdoor or in the industrial area. And those standalone storages are generally not subsidized in any area, but merely rely on different revenue streams of the liberalized energy market. So here the buzzword is the revenue stacking, which means that different revenue streams are stacked on top of each other. And when combined, those build the relevant business case for that storage. Um, so the first layer here is obviously the wholesale market where capacity may be marketed on the day ahead and intraday market. Here, the battery actually serves as a kind of insurance for the trading company using the battery. So not every trade actually leads to a physical reaction of the battery, but the battery is basically merely used in moments where market prices move in a different direction than expected by the operator. And this way, each quarter of an hour can be actually traded several times without even touching the physical flow at the connection point of the battery. So that's the first kind of stack of the revenue stream. Second important revenue stream is the auxiliary market of the TSOs, meaning the market for control reserve power. In Germany, this market consists of the product FCR, AFRR, and MFRR, so Frequency Control Reserve, Automatic Frequency Restoration, and MFRR. So the biggest market here is actually the AFMR market, which is the largest and probably most important market for batteries. 
this market has for a long time been actually the most relevant and probably only market that really produces a considerable revenue stream. However, we saw a huge volatility uh, also due to the Russian gas crisis as of 2022 onwards. So in the last two years, actually, you could earn lots of money also simply using a battery on the wholesale market and not purely relying on the auxiliary markets. So finally, there are some other actually optimization possibilities which are not as prominent as auxiliary market and wholesale part uh, market, which is, for example, the reactive power market. There is now a regulation being consulted by the Federal Network Agency um, that this market should be transferred into a tendering model as nowadays reactive power is only um, contracted on a bilateral basis between network operators and battery owners. Um, and furthermore, there is optimization potential with regard to so-called avoided network charges. The charges that may be received here by the battery owner can also be optimized depending on the load profile of the batteries. Last but not least, of course, with regard to industrial customers, that's actually a quite different business case from the standalone batteries, but still to mention it, of course, peak shaving and optimization against network charges plays a major role. Well, thank you. Thank you for the for the very broad summary. We, we You already touched upon the point that, that there is uh, revenue stacking uh, necessary uh, oftentimes for uh, large-scale battery systems. And uh, obviously, that is yeah, c can be complicated to pull off to to optimize all the different revenue streams streams in a very yeah optimized manner. And there are yeah companies companies that do that, but that uh, for me yields the question of of how good can these this this revenue stacking can be combined with with actually co-located renewable assets? Because obviously, both assets at the same time want to want to go. And, and, and optimize the grid uh, connection to, to their uh, needs and to optimize their revenue streams. While this is maybe more on a, on a, on a, on a, yeah, a technical restriction, uh, I would like to go into the, into the regulatory uh, framework for that. So how does that look like for, for co-located assets with batteries and, and yeah, for example, solar assets? Yeah, so so if we talk about co-location, the revenue streams look look actually quite different, of course. So so generally speaking, co-location with solar panels or wind turbines obviously, first of all, allows for the shifting of production to hours with higher prices, and particular allows PV systems to avoid price cannibalization in hours with high solar radiation and high wind levels. Apart from this pricing advantage, there is a separate su subsidy system in place for co-located storages with the, the lovely German name Innovationsausschreibungsverordnung, Innovation Tendering Regulation in English. Um, and this regulation provides for a fixed market premium, uh, which is different from the regular renewable market premium, which is always, as I just explained, the, a difference between a certain award and market prices. So that fixed premium is actually independent from actual market prices, meaning the operator always receives a fixed amount on top of the volatile spot market prices. And here, however, certain technical prerequisites have to be met. So, for example, the capacity of the storage has to amount to at least 25% of the installed total capacity of the plant combination. And in addition, the energy storage capacity must allow for at least two hours of storage at the rated output of the energy storage technology. Mm -hmm. Another one, and that's maybe the, the biggest hurdle in practice, is that both assets needs to be needs to be behind the same grid connection point. Mm -hmm. And why is that the case? So, so the thing is actually one of one of maybe the the hugest discussion or pain points at the moment is the so-called principle of exclusivity set up by the Renewable mm -hmm. Energy Act. So this, this principle basically states that any state funding granted to renewable generation is forfeited once green and gray electricity are mixed behind the same network connection points, meaning that if a co-located storage takes energy from the grid, the whole installation loses its, its funding for the whole respective calendar year. So, so to name a concrete okay. example with regard to co-location, those 
installations may, due to the exclusivity principle, not participate in the FCR market, as the FCR market is a symmetric product, meaning that um, mm -hmm. you can only bid into that market if you offer a negative and positive auxiliary service. Thus, you always take also take power, great power from the grid if you participate in that market. So if you, as a co-located installation, hold an award under the innovation tendering regulation and you bid into the FCR market, you sort of contaminate your green production and lose your EEG subsidy. Okay. And even though, even though you are providing system needs yeah, to, to, to ensure system stability, you are still penalized and lose your subsidy. Uh, exactly. Subsidy, that's very interesting. Okay, I mean, we talked about revenue stacking already, and and analysis also suggests that that stacking revenues and making use of all of the available revenue streams. We we talked about ancillary services already, but also they had an intraday arbitrage is not only optimizing the revenues for a battery or a co-located uh, project, but also is providing system needs. So my question here is, I guess. Why is this then a part of the regulation that, that you lose your subsidy if you are providing uh, necessary system needs? Yeah, that's a very good question, actually. So I guess this principle kind of goes back to the very beginning of renewable legislation. And I guess it's a mix of state aid and consumer protection considerations. So in the very beginning of the energy transition, transition, Germany really only wanted to subsidize those technologies that constituted a great step forward regarding energy transition and climate protection. Um, however, at the, in the 1990s, the share of renewable energy in the electricity grid was, of course, vanishingly low. So further down the road and with increasing share of intermittent generation, the system view actually becomes increasingly important, if you just mentioned, and which means that actually we should not only consider subsidizing renewables, but we should consider subsidizing renewables that produce the least system costs, right? And these are certainly renewables that are combined with batteries. So mm -hmm. it actually would rather make sense to, to foster this co-location approach instead of putting hurdles in the way of, of such projects. Yeah, exactly. Especially given the fact that, I mean, especially solar assets are not made, making too much use uh, of, of the existing grid connections, given that they are only running in about 1000 hours a, a year. Okay, very, very interesting background. Thank you for that. So thinking one step further then, and, and, and thinking about potential changes in the legislation, which changes would there be that have would have been in, that would need to be introduced to allow batteries to charge from the grid? in these subsidized co-located setups? Yeah. So I think the industry kind of agrees that if really great power is first taken from the grid and then fed back into the grid, these electricity amounts should not receive any subsidy. Mm -hmm. um, however, in a world where digitalization and smart meter are gaining ground, um, there should be basically a simple math calculation rule installed in metering systems that through their calculation logic avoid any overfunding of these co-located projects meaning it's conceivably easy obviously right to simply mm -hmm. deduct the power taken from the grid from the power actually fed back into the grid by such a co-located project um, yeah. and and even more in germany it's it's actually quite easy because the the, the subsidy is calculated on a monthly basis, right? So the, the tr mm -hmm. traditional market premium is not really looking at every single quarter hour and the respective prices. So it it looks at an average. So even if such an algorithm or such a calculation rule would allocate, let's say, the wrong quarter of an hour to mm -hmm. the electricity production, because in that quarter of an hour, under another calculation, we would say this power would have be, to be considered grain instead of green. Always yeah. the same price, always the same subsidy is applicable. So, so I think in Germany, it wouldn't be too complicated, actually, to set up some sort of calculation principle that allows to distinguish between green and gray power. Yeah, exactly. And I think the, 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 the technical requirements are also there. Uh, as you mentioned, we, we have the the. the technical prerequisites to install these these meters and i think they are also 
countries already to be, for example, that that have in, implemented similar similar ways of of yeah calculating the amount of of energy that that can be subsidized. Thank you for that. So let's think about you mentioned earlier that that there are actually different types of of subsidies for renewables assets. One is the the standard, I would say, EEG subsidy that that guarantees a sliding market premium or even a fixed top up as a, as a market premium, and there is and there is the innovation auction. If we now think about a change in legislation, would that actually mean that both of the, if we would implement such change in, in legislation, would that actually mean that both of these asset types would benefit from that? I think so. So it's. Uh... It's a deci policy decision, obviously. So I think with mm -hmm. regard to existing assets, you would obviously need some sort of wording that a storage that is newly built next to such an existing plant would not le lead to a new commissioning of the whole combination, right? So otherwise, mm -hmm. probably decreased feed-in tariffs or decreased market premiums would be applicable, but you would need some sort of regulation stating that if the battery is added to an existing system, the once granted subsidy remains the same and it does not lead to a new commissioning of the whole plant combination. Of course, new mm -hmm. projects, it's it's completely easy. You don't even need any kind of sunset clause, but you can just implement okay. that as, as yeah. done with the innovation options. Okay, interesting. And what about home storages? Because they obviously face the same the same hurdle because they obviously want the the power that is fed into the grid subsidized. So would that also help them, or is that a separate yeah instance in the with regard to the to to the German law? It would probably help them as well with home storages. It's always a bit more complicated. You can because you have a a, a, a second and a third player in this field, right? You have the the PV installation, then you have the battery, and then you have the consumer, right? So, so you mm -hmm. need to kind of distinguish those energy flows, which which makes it a bit more complex. But regarding participation in the markets, it would probably be be the same effect with regard to feed and tariff. I think we would need a bit more a bit more wording in the renewables act because because feed and tariff is treated a bit differently than the market premium. I think the biggest hurdle for mm -hmm. home storage is probably participation in the auxiliary services market, right? Because pre-qualification for those kind of small scale system is much more challenging and much yeah, more exactly. cost inefficient than qualification of utility scale storages. Okay. Okay, cool. All right. Then, yeah, I mean, we, we talked already about some uh, potential uh, changes in legislation. Obviously, the uh, German government also is interested in facilitating flexibility build out in the German system and they recently published their storage strategy and with regards to the large scale batteries the ideas from my point of view can be divided into two topics one is the support for storage build out and one is the better system of the system integration of storages in the first category we find a range of changes that might ease the regulation and planning uncertainty by, for example, reducing permitting obstacles, more transparent regulation on the so-called Baukosten Zuschuss, but also extending storage storage's exemption from grid fees and a couple of other points that I don't want to mention here. This is undoubtedly useful, but I'd like to focus more on some language in the in the second category, where where they say next to or next to creating incentives to provide auxiliary services as well as supporting electric vehicle integration and bidirectional charging, this document actually indicates that, that the legislator might want to change regulation with regards to, this, uh, to the distinction of gray and green power. And, and from your point of view, is there a foreseeable change in the logic where power counts as gray or green? So what I know is that there are very concrete considerations in the Ministry of Economics to mm -hmm. change the exclusivity principle in favor of storages. So, so what we hear that there are basically two different options on the table. I think both options have their, their challenges and difficulties in practice. So the first option is to allow for switch between a kind of purely green utilization of the storage and a mixed approach. So mm -hmm. as with direct marketing, the 
operator of the co-located plant is entitled to switch between a mixed production and a purely green production every two months. To be honest, this monthly approach is probably not very useful for a market which is actually depending on price changes within seconds and minutes, right? So mm -hmm. a normal battery is optimized with regard to the smallest price differences and, and has to react very, very fast to, to really optimize and to really use all the volatility that we have in the market. So to exactly. oblige this operator to choose on a monthly basis between different models and use cases is probably quite far away from the business model that we see right now in the market. The other option is actually quite similar so to what I've just mentioned before to simply utilize technology and smart metering to distinguish between gray and green power. However, here it seems that the uh, ministry is taking a quite complicated approach to have actually two different institutions deciding on the right algorithm to use. So right now, the Physikalische Technische Bundesanstalt and the Security Authority, the BSE, are supposed mm -hmm. to set up a concrete algorithm that is then mandatorily used to distinguish between the two power flows. There again, the question is, is that really speeding up development or is that just actually slowing things down? And do we need like an official authority to actually put their stamp on a probably rather easy algorithm to be used or can we just not rely on the market here okay very very interesting yeah i mean you mentioned you mentioned it already the question is how how fast can this be implemented if there are two public entities in in charge of of coming up with a with a complicated or maybe complicated algorithm that is actually not that complicated mm -hmm. so i mean do you have a do do you, do you have a gut feeling of uh, whether or not this could be something that's still Uh, comes in this um, uh, legislative period or is that something for, for the next period? Hard to say. I mean, it's not officially published. So I think there is, there is the concern that this is not going to be passed in the last year of this government. But of mm -hmm. course, it's such an obvious point that I think the industry has justified hopes that somebody will, will kind of have a quick pen here and, and, and pass this law still, still this year or at the beginning of next year. Okay, interesting. Yeah, would, would be very much looking forward to that. Let's, let's jump into an, another topic as well, because we talked a lot about revenue stacking and, and uh, yeah, subsidies for renewables assets. But also there is yeah, some, some downside of renewables with regards to its deployment at sites far from the load centers, which then in turn results in power flows and can bring the power grid to its limits. But that then, yeah, requires grid enforcement. Yeah, while this is being addressed in Germany, obviously permitting and building processes take a long time. And in the meantime, system operators need to take some actions to change the plant dispatch and avoid grid overload. So this this process is called redispatch. And yeah, this frequent, frequently leads to curtailment of renewable generators. And my question here is, what is... What, what actually happens if a, if a co-located renewable asset, so uh, for example, solar asset and co-located with a battery is then curtailed? What, what happens there? So it's actually quite similar to the, to the usual curtailment. So the, the plant has to stop producing and the, the owner mm. of the plant gets compensated for its uh, lost profits mm. and including also opportunity costs and the balancing responsible party, meaning the marketing company, receives some sort of balancing settlement by the TSO, which is, however, suspended in Germany at the moment, and it only constitutes a financial compensation today. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And in a co-located setup, uh, wouldn't it make sense to let the battery charge the otherwise curtailed energy? That would make perfect sense. Under the current regime, however, the curtailment really refers to the concrete installation and not to the network connection point, meaning that if the installation would keep on producing and would feed the power into a storage, it would potentially violate the network operator's redispatch instruction. So it's mm -hmm. not something that is sort of legal under the current redispatch regime. Okay, so you can't get around that. Interesting. And I mean, there's another change or recent change in the German I'm just going to call it energy law, ENVG. 
In the paragraph 13K in the German ENVG, the legislator makes makes very clear that using green energy rather than curtailing it is, is of high priority. And to achieve this, they set out a complicated mechanism for the TSOs to detail out, which which is aiming at yeah, actually reducing curtailment, but but rather storing it, for example, in storages, but also using it for other local demand for potentially a cheaper price. But isn't there an easier solution to the problem? For example, uh, if you stored the power in co-located bat batteries when they are yeah, implemented there already? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so storing power in co-located batteries would actually be one of the use cases of this new Section 13K uh, Energy Industry Act. Um, however, the co-located battery would have to participate in the tender proce procedure conducted by the TSOs in order to be eligible to actually take the power from the renewable installation. So to me, it's not entirely clear, to be honest, why this mechanism is so complicated. The fear of the German legislator is, as in many other cases, that the generators may get some sort of windfall profits by receiving the redispatch compensation on the one hand and then still having the power stored somewhere else and reselling it at later hours for high prices. So in order to avoid these windfall profits, I feel it would have probably been easier to go without a tendering process and instead simply probably shorten the redispatch compensation in case the energy is actually stored. So for example, one could perceive that the operator that stores the electricity in case of a curtailment would not receive a balancing settlement by the TSO because the energy is actually not lost, but simply stored somewhere else. So again, the legislator just puts on another layer of regulation on top of the already complicated system. So maybe mm -hmm. it would have made sense to, to merely change that existing system instead of putting a new framework for another tendering procedure on top of that already complicated redispatch regime. Okay, interesting. Cool. I think we are about at the end of time. So my, my, my final question is here to you, as you are more into the into the law practice as I am, and, and following the, the, the legislator a little bit closer than, than than we are at Aurora. What do you think are the major points for the for the legislator to address in the next legislative period when you, when when we focus on storage? And yeah, do you have any projections on how this will play out? Yeah, I think one one mechanism that is already announced to be introduced is that capacity market. Here we see that the legislator is favoring actually H2 gas fired power plants at the moment, but still batteries mm -hmm. are mentioned. So I think that there is some hope that at least some long duration battery storage types may participate in such a capacity market, which would mm -hmm. lead, of course, to another res uh, revenue stream and potentially increase bankability of these projects. Yeah. So I think that would be one wish from me, but also from the industry to have that implemented in the next period. And then I think it would be great to simplify these regulatory hurdles you already mentioned. So we don't have a very clear network connection regime. It could be, it could be quite easy. We could implement some fixed dates until which network operators have to reply to grid connection requests by storage, storage operators. We do have case law now by the upper court of Düsseldorf on the building cost subsidy that this is not legal. So I think instead of waiting until the Supreme Court decides on that issue, it would be quite useful if the Federal Network Agency took a step forward and made a clear statement of how building cost subsidies are calculated for storage. Ideally not... Yep using the full capacity price, but only a, a rather little share in order to, to consider and to promote the effects the batteries have for the whole, whole network. Mm -hmm. And I think last but not least, it's, it's actually quite interesting to talk about home storage systems. So already nowadays, the home storage capacity is seven times as big as the utility scale standalone batteries so if we found a way to include this capacity really in our uh, electricity system and to allow those storage systems to fully participate in the relevant market wholesale and auxiliary i think we could really increase the share of green electricity in the market by mm -hmm. by high high percentages and, and and really took a step forward towards energy transition 
Yeah, indeed. Very, very promising indeed. Cool. Thank you, Anna, for the very, very detailed insights in this podcast. Thank you very much for joining Energy Unplugged. Thank you and goodbye. Thanks, Ted. That was Thaddeus Kreisig, a project leader in Aurora's advisory team in Germany, talking to Anna von Bremen, partner at Osborne Clark, Germany. Do keep an eye on our podcast feed for more in-depth conversations with senior members of the energy industry. The best way to do this is to subscribe on whatever platform you use. Thanks for listening and goodbye.